Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. There's a new trend going around in the commercial space industry when it comes to launch abort systems. All three companies who are putting abort systems on their crewed vehicles have ditched that classic launch abort tower we've seen dominate abort systems in the past. Previous vehicles like the Mercury capsule, the Apollo capsule, and even the Soyuz capsule all used an escape tower that sat on top of the crew module, capable of pulling the vehicle away from a failing rocket in a hurry. And to make this topic even more interesting, we're seeing another trend in abort systems. SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule and Boeing Starliner capsules both are using liquid-fueled abort motors instead of solid rocket motors. So today we're gonna to talk about the design considerations that have made SpaceX, Boeing, and Blue Origin ditch abort towers on their crewed vehicles, and we're also going to evaluate why the heck are Boeing and SpaceX going with liquid rocket motors instead of solid rocket motors? And with both SpaceX and Boeing having experienced serious setbacks and complications with their liquid-fueled abort systems, including the loss of a test vehicle, it raises the question, is it even a good idea? Now there's a lot of fun engineering decisions behind each and every system. So let's get started. Three, two, one, and Now, I've talked about abort systems quite a bit in the past. I have a video explaining why SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule has fins on the trunk, which help keep it pointy end up and flamey end down in the event of an abort. And I have another video talking about why the Gemini capsule went with an ejection seat instead of a launch abort tower. So for a short rundown on mechanical abort systems, here's a brief overview. If you're sitting on top of a skyscraper full of explosive materials, it's generally considered a good idea to have a way to evacuate quickly if things go wrong. Now, the way abort systems originally worked was by having a trio of wires running down the entire length of the tanks of the rocket. If any two of them were severed, it triggered an abort system to fire up the motors and detach the crew module within a fraction of a second. The abort motors have to be powerful enough to pull the vehicle away from a failing rocket as quickly as possible. These systems can pull up to 15 Gs of acceleration for a few seconds. Now, I'm not saying that sounds like fun, but uh, no, that actually sounds awful. That sounds like being hit by a semi truck for a few seconds continually. Yeah, no thanks. And since the very beginning of human spaceflight, well, at least in the United States, engineers opted for a launch escape tower stuck on top of the capsule. You'll notice some fancy scaffolding with a few really powerful rocket motors attached to it on top of the Mercury capsule, the Apollo capsule, the Soyuz capsule, China's Shenzhou capsule, as well as the upcoming Orion capsule and India's Gaganyan capsule. All of these vehicles also use solid rocket motors in the abort system because solid rocket motors are very powerful for their size, they can be lit in an instant, they're simple, and are relatively safe to have sitting around idle. This configuration with a tower is called a tractor or a puller system. Since the motors are in front of the vehicle and they pull the vehicle free as opposed to most rocket motors, which are at the bottom end of the vehicle and they push it. The three newest capsules that will be carrying humans to space have opted to ditch the tractor abort systems and go with a different approach called a pusher system. And even more interestingly, SpaceX, Boeing, and Blue Origin all have wildly different reasons for doing so. So let's start off with Blue Origin and their New Shepard capsule. New Shepard is one of two players in the suborbital tourism game, competing with Virgin Galactic and their spaceship to space plane. But Blue Origin's New Shepard is the only one of these two that offers an abort system. The abort system that Blue Origin decided to go with is a solid rocket motor placed smack in the middle of their capsule underneath what looks like a beautiful table, but is actually a large chunk of blast resistant and high pressure tubing holding the solid rocket motor. As mentioned before, this makes it a pusher system since the exhaust comes out of the bottom of the vehicle when used during an abort. Now, an interesting note with this system is how wobbly it looks when in use. This is likely because the center of thrust is very close to the center of mass, making it inherently less stable. I talked about this briefly in the video about why the Crew Dragon capsule has fins on the trunk, saying it looks like New Shepard could use some aero surfaces to help keep it more stable. But then again, as long as it gets the heck out of there, it's probably fine. Blue Origin's use of a solid rocket booster makes sense for this abort system. Since it's only to be used in an emergency, it just kind of hangs out there hoping to never need to be used, something a solid rocket motor does perfectly. Its high thrust to weight ratio and safe storage makes it a no-brainer for this. So now we can ask ourselves, 
why didn't they go with a more traditional escape tower? First off, the new Shepard is trying to operate as inexpensively and frequently as possible by being fully reusable. Its booster very impressively lands itself propulsively, and the capsule relies on safe and reliable parachutes to make a soft touchdown. The name of the game is little to no refurbishment. A launch abort tower is traditionally jettisoned once its useful window of operation has passed to free up dead weight from the vehicle. But with a suborbital system that only goes straight up and straight back down, you'd think they'd probably just keep the tower on. And this is especially true since there's no docking port that would need to be uncovered because the new Shepard vehicle doesn't dock with anything. But say you did leave it on, it's pretty safe to assume you wouldn't want to deploy your parachutes in the vicinity of that launch escape tower because there'd be a pretty big risk of them getting tangled up in it. So in the case of a launch abort tower, mission success relies on that tower being ditched or else the parachutes won't work correctly. So that raises the question. Is it better to design a system that requires a separation event every single flight in order to be successful? Or do you want to design a system that only needs to be used in an emergency? And besides that, Blue Origin wouldn't want to ditch the abort tower in flight since it could land pretty close to their facilities, and it would be likely destroyed with each and every flight, which would add to the cost. But there's perhaps even a bigger reason why Blue Origin went with the pusher system. And by bigger, I mean bigger. Take a look at these puller systems. Do you notice anything missing? Polar systems almost always have a protective fairing or a shell that covers the windows and the rest of the vehicle to protect the vehicle if the abort system is used. It'd generally be a good idea to make sure your windows are covered up so you don't completely obliterate them. Granted, Mercury capsules had a window and an escape tower, but on the Mercury capsule, the motors were much higher up on the tower than other systems. And we did things a little differently in the early days of human spaceflight that just might be frowned upon today. Since polar abort motors and windows don't typically go hand in hand, covering up the world's largest windows that go to space would be a pretty big shame. Since New Shepard's entire purpose is to provide the ultimate tourist experience with stunning views, they sure want to make sure seeing out those big, giant, beautiful windows is a top priority. So for Blue Origin, the use of a pusher type solid rocket motor abort system makes the most sense. Next up, let's talk about Boeing Starliner and SpaceX's crew Dragon capsules, which both were designed for NASA to send crews up to the International Space Station. Now these are purpose-built taxis to the ISS first and foremost, although both vehicles may see commercial use someday for private customers. I have a video that dives really deep into both of these vehicles and the rockets they ride on, and then I compared them to the Space Shuttle and Soyuz, the other vehicles that visit the ISS. So if you need a rundown on what the history is, the specs, and all of the considerations of these vehicles, definitely check this video out. Both SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule and Boeing Starliner opted to use a pusher system too. They've chosen to ditch the tower. But both of these vehicles also opted to use liquid-fueled abort motors instead of the more traditional solid rocket motors. Now you might be thinking, how can a liquid-fueled rocket engine be quick and safe enough to be relied upon for an emergency abort? I mean, after all, rocket engines can take several seconds to get the pump spinning and for ignition to occur, so... That doesn't really sound like a good option. Well, these liquid-fueled rocket engines are using a similar system to what's used in reaction control systems, which offer very quick and reliable ignition. They do this by utilizing a pumpless rocket engine known as a pressure-fed engine. Pressure-fed engines just have their propellant stored in a very high-pressure tank. They open a valve, and they let it rip. And to make it even more reliable, the pressure-fed engines used on these abort motors run on hypergolic propellants. Hypergolic propellants burn on contact with each other, so there's no need for a secondary ignition source like a spark or a flame. This makes the pressure-fed hypergolic engine very simple, quick-acting, and reliable. A great choice for reaction control and abort motors. But it should also be noted that although hypergolic fuels are very stable and reliable, they're incredibly toxic, cancerogenic, and just really nasty stuff. So why did both companies choose liquid-fueled abort motors? Now, there's a few reasons, but first and foremost, it's likely due to increased safety requirements from NASA. They want what's known as a full envelope abort system, or the ability to abort safely from any point in the flight. 
Now, solid rocket motors can provide this option too. For instance, the Orion capsule solid rocket tractor system offers an abort mode for the first two minutes of flight, after which the tower is jettisoned, and the second stage of the SLS system or the service module's AJ-10 engine can provide abort options. But with liquid-fueled abort motors, they can fire them for less time or lower thrust than a solid rocket motor, which gives them the ability to place the vehicle precisely into a desired trajectory to either re-enter safely or abort to orbit, which can make it easier to design a full envelope abort window. But quite frankly, each company could have gone with a typical tractor solid rocket motor abort system. As a matter of fact, SpaceX's original concepts for the Crew Dragon capsule, or Dragon Rider as they called it back then, was going to utilize a traditional tower and then jettison it on ascent, as we can see in this animation from 2010. So the first reason each company opted for a pusher system is the same reason we talked about before. By removing a separation event, you're eliminating a potential mission failure scenario. By integrating the abort system into the vehicle, it simplifies the sequence of events needed for mission success. But integrating the abort system doesn't necessarily mean they're required to use liquid fuels, does it? I mean, New Shepard gets away with it. Well, there's two reasons why utilizing liquid fuel abort motors in these cases are actually more useful or even necessary in an integrated abort system. The first reason is control. Liquid fuel rocket motors can steer and point the vehicle by doing something called thrust differential which is where they can increase or decrease thrust on any of the motors, and that can help point it in the correct way. This definitely helps keep the pointy end up and the flamey end down. Now, there are ways to control a solid rocket motor, but thrust differential isn't one of them. So in order to steer a solid abort tower, one cool way is by having a separate solid motor fire and having multiple valves open and close on each side of the tower. Take a look at this Orion Attitude Control Motor Test. Inside there is a solid rocket motor that lights and cannot be turned off once activated. But in order to provide steering, they can vary how much thrust comes out of any of its eight valves. To provide neutral input, they just open up all eight valves equally, which then will produce no change in direction. They then stick this unit really high up on the abort tower to provide maximum leverage over the vehicle, which helps provide ample control during the abort. I think this is really cool. In a pusher system, there's no tower to provide leverage, so you can't put control surfaces up there. So using a solid rocket motor that can't provide thrust differential can be a bit of a no-no. But there's actually another reason why you can't use solid rocket motors on these two vehicles. And that's because these vehicles visit the International Space Station. And because they visit the International Space Station, the abort motors also visit the station. This means 32 times a day, the vehicle has extreme changes in temperature or thermal cycles. Now, hypergolics are happy as a clam and stable hanging out in these conditions. As a matter of fact, there's hypergolics on the station as we speak. But thermal cycling a solid rocket motor that much could potentially lead to some unintended booms. And that's definitely not a good thing when you're attached to the world's single most expensive piece of machinery with precious human lives on board. Okay, so why are they even bothering integrating the launch abort system at all? This all sounds like an awful lot of trouble. Well, besides the simplicity of an integrated system not needing to separate, the two companies actually have very different reasons for their integration. Boeing modified some Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-88 Bantam motors to run on the same fuel as the reaction control system that is part of their service module of Starliner instead of the alcohol and liquid oxygen they normally use. The service module also houses the solar panels and radiators of the vehicle. By using the same fuel for the abort and reaction control systems, it means in a nominal mission, the abort system obviously isn't utilized, which means the extra propellant can be used for other things. Besides having more fuel for orbital maneuvering, you also end up with spare propellant to potentially help reboost the International Space Station. Now, this is something only Russia's Progress Resupply Vehicle and the Cygnus Cargo Vehicle can currently do, but the retired space shuttle and the ATV vehicle could also do it previously. Having the ability to reboost the station is definitely a nice selling point. Although we don't have any confirmation whether or not Starliner will ever perform this maneuver, but at least having it isn't a bad option at all. But now for SpaceX, perhaps their biggest reason why they didn't want to ditch their motors is because they designed the Dragon capsule to be reused as much as possible. This means by integrating the abort motors with the capsule itself, they would recover them with each flight. But ironically, the Dragon capsule is less reusable than the Starliner since the crew Dragon capsule splashes down as opposed to the Starliner, which will land on land. 
This means the Crew Dragon capsule will never be reused for crew and will only be reused as a cargo vessel. And what's even more ironic is the Starliner, which lands on land and can be reused up to 10 times, ditches its abort motors with each and every flight as the service module which houses the abort motors is jettisoned before re-entry. So the vehicle which lands on land ditches its abort motors and the one that lands in the ocean keeps its abort motors. That's interesting. But the main reason why SpaceX's Crew Dragon has the Super Draco liquid-fueled abort motors in the first place isn't just for abort options. They originally intended to land the Dragon capsule propulsively. Yes, that's right, they originally intended to land the Dragon capsule much like SpaceX lands its Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets, riding pillars of flames. It's so cool. And now the original reason for landing propulsively was for rapid and easy reuse of the vehicle. Not only that, but they also wanted the Dragon capsule to land on Mars. SpaceX's original goal with Dragon was to land it on Mars for a mission dubbed Red Dragon, but the whole propulsive landing idea got scrapped. SpaceX gave up on pursuing propulsive landing with the Dragon capsule mostly because NASA really wasn't interested in the concept, as it would require far too much additional work to certify. So now that we've talked about why each company ditched the tower, and why both Boeing and SpaceX has opted to use liquid fuel propellants for its launch abort systems, it raises the question, is it even a good idea? Both Boeing and SpaceX have had problems when testing their liquid abort systems. Boeing experienced an anomaly with a Starliner test vehicle in 2018 when preparing to do a pad abort test, where the hypergolic fuels leaked out of the vehicle. SpaceX had something a little more energetic happen in 2019 when preparing to do a static fire test prior to an in-flight abort test with their recovered DM-1 Crew Dragon capsule. In my opinion, these issues will all get worked out. I mean, these fuels used in these systems are the same or very similar to almost all orbital spacecraft. I mean, after all, satellites often use hypergolic fuels and a liquid motor to do their orbital maneuvering. The space shuttle had hypergolic fuels for its orbital maneuvering system, and hypergolics are already used on Dragon 1 for well over a dozen missions, and there rarely has been any issues with these systems. In general, these systems can be safe, simple, and reliable. So why are we seeing such major problems arise when testing them? Well, the public relation answer is that's why we test. But I kind of have a feeling it has to do with how you test this stuff. You oftentimes you go beyond what you would normally be doing and doing things in these testing campaigns that wouldn't normally be done on the launch pad. But as far as is it a good idea? I mean, I think so. The fuels are already on the vehicle in the first place, so it makes sense to use them for a launch abort system. Liquid fueled abort systems are useful, potentially reusable, and actually make for a simpler spacecraft and mission profile. Not to mention, when they're not used, they can be utilized for other purposes such as reboosting the ISS or even propulsively landing. Although we probably won't ever see either of those things happen. I'm sure each company is learning from the failures of these systems, and I have little doubt this will all be sorted out before we ever put humans on board. And hopefully that's sooner rather than later. So it is interesting that we went from one common form of launch abort to suddenly three 21st century companies using wildly different systems. But in the long run, each company has a unique reason behind their engineering decisions, which I find fun. So does this help answer your questions of why companies have scrapped abort towers or why they're now using liquid fueled rocket motors? Let me know if you have any other questions about this topic in the comments below. In keeping with this trend of talking about escape systems, I plan on making a video about why SpaceX doesn't plan to use an abort system on their upcoming Starship and help answer the question of whether or not that's a good idea. I owe a huge thanks to all my Patreon supporters for helping me make videos like this and all other content possible. Patreon members get exclusive access to a subreddit and a Discord channel, as well as exclusive live streams and early access to some videos. So. If you want to help support what I do, please head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out my web store for lots of fun new merchandise such as Gridfin Nauta Coasters, hats like this, prints, maybe t-shirts like this, lots of other fun stuff at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. As always, all the music in my videos is original, and you can listen to some of my music on Spotify or iTunes or Amazon or Google Music or really wherever you listen to music. For easy links, go to everydayastronaut.com slash music. Share it with a friend. Thanks, everybody. That does it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Thank you.